Let's talk about NASA's SLS rocket, the muscle behind the Artemis program, and humanity's prospective return to the moon. This is a rocket that is steeped in decades of history, both figuratively and literally. The SLS is the most powerful spaceship ever launched from the Earth, our first super heavy lift vehicle since the original moon rocket of the 1960s, the Saturn V. And the SLS is NASA's first new design since the space shuttle of the 1970s. And while the Saturn V and the space shuttle came together with massive enthusiasm at breakneck speeds from inception to launch in just five years each, the SLS has been decades in the making. Taking launch hardware from the 1970s, a design concept from the early 2000s, and garnishing with the latest technology of the modern day. It's been a long road getting from there to here, and it's not been without bumps, which would be putting it lightly. It almost feels like NASA drove through the ditch to get this thing on the launch pad. And without getting overly dramatic, the fate of the US space agency is kinda riding on this spaceship to nail its first test flight and first major mission to the moon all on the same day. The story of the SLS involves a lot of history, a lot of engineering, and a lot of politics. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. The SLS is the first proper sequel to NASA's original moon rocket, the Saturn V, a rocket that began development in 1962 launched for the first time in 67, and for the last time in 73. In the time since, there has been no space agency or aerospace company that has put anything onto a launch pad that matched the Saturn V in terms of performance and power. It stood like a monument to human ingenuity and capability, what we are capable of when we work together towards a common goal and reach for the stars. It's also the product of a spectacular amount of money. It cost six and a half billion dollars to develop the Saturn V in 1960s money. That's over 50 billion in today's terms. In 1966, in the lead up to the first launch, NASA was receiving over 4% of the total federal budget of the United States. By the 1970s and 80s, NASA funding had fallen to around 1% of total federal spending, and by 2010, when SLS was officially announced, that had fallen to just about one half of 1%. The projected cost of the SLS when it was first announced was to be $10 billion with a five-year development cycle. That was in 2011. Obviously, it ended up taking twice the amount of time and costing about twice that amount of money. What did we get for that price? Well, we did not get the marvel of invention that was the Saturn V. The F1 engines that powered that rocket will likely go down as the single most powerful rocket engine ever built. The nozzles are so big that you could park an SUV inside them. And the total thrust was just under 700 metric tons per engine. The new generation of modern rocket engines like the SpaceX Raptor 2 and the Blue Origin BE-4 are sitting around 230 to 250 tons of thrust by comparison. The modern approach is to strap in a larger quantity of smaller engines to produce maximum lift. It's a smarter system, but they didn't have the capability to make anything that complex back in the day. So they just set four of these monster F1s under their rocket and blasted off for the moon. The SLS is able to max out at 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust thanks to its combination of solid fuel side boosters and liquid hydrogen powered core engines. This is about 15% more power than the old Saturn V and what put the SLS as the new most powerful rocket ever launched, for now at least. So the Space Launch System rocket was first unveiled by NASA in 2011 and at the time, this came as a bit of a surprise because the president of the United States was Barack Obama. 
and he was not particularly interested in federally funded space exploration. It's not necessarily that he didn't think spaceflight was important, but the Obama administration saw the development of the private sector with companies like SpaceX moving at a rapid pace and was more interested in pursuing a collaborative plan between public and private funding for the future of human spaceflight. So it was a bit of a subversive move by some Republican and centrist politicians to push through the SLS development. There's a new book by former NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver that details a lot of what was going on behind the scenes at the time. According to her recounting, Senator Kay Hutchinson of Texas and Senator Bill Nelson of Florida were the champions of the SLS and managed to generate enough support to put the rocket into development against the wishes of the sitting administration. Bill Nelson is now the chief administrator of NASA as the rocket prepares to launch. So, small world, I guess. Longtime followers of the space program would know that the design of SLS actually bears a striking resemblance to a previous NASA rocket. No, we're not talking about the space shuttle. Not yet, at least. But we are talking about the Ares 5. This was the shining jewel of the Constellation program. Now, what the hell is that? Constellation was basically the foundation that the entire Artemis program is built on. Artemis is Constellation Take Two. This came out of the Vision for Space Exploration plan of George W. Bush during the second term of office in 2004. Constellation would be the immediate successor to the Space Shuttle program, with a plan for crewed orbital flights on the Ares 1 rocket, and eventually, flights to the Moon and Mars on the monster Ares 5. Ares 5 is a vision of what could have been. 188 metric tons of lift capability to low Earth orbit. That's significantly more than the 118 tons capability of the Saturn V, and even more than Elon Musk's current aspirations for his new Starship rocket at 100 tons. The Ares 5 was to be powered by two solid rocket side boosters and six liquid fueled core engines. The RS 68, an upgrade on the RS 25 hydrogen engine from the Space Shuttle. The goals of the Constellation program were very ambitious a crewed landing on the Moon, of course, but they also wanted to land a crewed mission on a near Earth asteroid and then put humans on Mars by 2030. It was all very cool and very expensive. Estimated cost at $230 billion of 2004 money. By 2009, five years after its inception and with no substantial progress made, a committee finding ruled that the Constellation program would be impossible to complete without a substantial increase in funding, which the newly elected Barack Obama wasn't interested in doing. But from the ashes of Constellation rose the Space Launch System. The ambitions of a super heavy lift rocket to reach the Moon and Mars remained. But obviously with a new focus on keeping this cost down and sustainable. Also, just wanted to let you know about our Discord server. We've got over 1,500 members and host regular live watch parties within the community. We have some big events coming up for the first Starship launch, Artemis launch, and Tesla AI day. So if you aren't already, join our Discord server using the link in the description. So one thing that the SLS design and the Ares 5 concept share is a striking resemblance to the old space shuttle. The SLS is basically like taking the thrust section from the shuttle vehicle and putting it on the bottom of a fuel tank, and then taking the crew section and putting it on the top, and then scaling the whole thing up to about double the size. This was done both figuratively and literally. So when NASA was trying to figure out how to build their monster rocket without breaking the bank this time around, they started eyeing up their old stock of space shuttle parts and getting some ideas. The SLS is powered by four RS-25 engines. These are the same liquid hydrogen fuel burning engines that powered the space shuttle. It had three of them on board. This was the first engine that NASA designed to be fully reusable. 
hence the clean burning hydrogen fuel that doesn't leave behind carbon deposits that gunk up the engine after launch. And when we say these are the same engines, we mean literally the same engines that are in the SLS core stage right now were previously used in shuttle launches. NASA says that they have a stock of 16 RS-25 flight engines that were transferred from the shuttle program to SLS. Unlike with the space shuttle, the core stage of SLS will not be recovered. So these previously multi-use engines will meet their end at the bottom of the ocean after a single SLS flight. Same goes for those massive side boosters that take care of the heavy lifting for SLS. Of the total 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, about 6 million are coming from the side boosters. These are five segment solid rocket boosters, an upgrade over the four segment boosters on the shuttle. And you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that four of the five casing segments on the SLS boosters are also recycled from the shuttle program. When they were launched with the shuttle, the side boosters would actually deploy parachutes and float back down for a recovery. So NASA still had the spent casting sitting around and in another cost saving measure, recycled them for SLS while adding about 25% more impulse to the performance, but eliminating the parachute deployment. These casings will also see their final flight with SLS. So props for being resourceful. We can't take that away from NASA. They've turned 30 year old rocket parts from a vehicle that was only ever designed for low earth orbit and made them into a new super heavy moon rocket. Though at the same time, we can't help but feel a bit of a sting that these designs that were so revolutionary because they were reusable and sustainable are now going to become garbage after one single launch. Feels like a step backwards or at the very least sideways. It's difficult to see this as anything truly forward thinking. NASA has said that the SLS can't be reusable because they need maximum lift capability and they do have a point. When you reuse a booster like the Falcon 9 or try and land an entire two-stage vehicle like the Starship, you have to keep a bunch of fuel in reserve to accomplish the landing burn. And that's fuel that you can't use to put more weight into space. Falcon 9 can put nearly 23 tons of mass into orbit if SpaceX uses its full capability and expended the booster. But for a reusable flight, they've only gone as far as just over 16 tons. Even the bleeding edge SpaceX Starship, which will have vastly more power than SLS, is only conceived to deliver about 100 tons to low Earth orbit with a fully reusable first and second stage. So SLS is on the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center right now as we speak, and it's about to launch a mission to the moon. This is the maiden voyage of the SLS. It's never even done a test flight. Artemis 1 is the test flight. This is not a standard operating procedure for a new rocket, obviously. Remember when Elon Musk launched his car into space? The reason he did that was because SpaceX needed a dummy payload to test the Falcon Heavy. They weren't going to put a real mission into space on the first ever launch of a new rocket because even Elon Musk wasn't that insane. He might be now, but he wasn't at the time. And NASA had planned to test the SLS before Artemis. They were supposed to launch the rocket for the first time in 2016 as a proof of concept. And then they were supposed to launch it again to test putting the Orion spacecraft into orbit around the Earth. And then they were going to launch the whole setup to orbit around the moon. Instead, we are just YOLOing a very important new crew rated spaceship to the moon on a totally unpredictable rocket. And then with Artemis 2, which will be the second ever flight of the SLS, we're going to have people sitting in the top. Obviously astronauts are brave as hell, but putting your ass on top of a rocket that has a track record of one launch, that's a whole other thing. This is something that Lori Garver also talks about in her book. She kind of points out that no one at NASA is talking about what might happen if Artemis 1 
doesn't go absolutely perfectly. Garver said recently in an interview, there is not another test flight planned if this doesn't go perfectly. So then what? You're going to put people on one in two years from now if the first one didn't go well? I just have never heard anyone talk about that plan, end quote. It's pretty grim to consider, but if Artemis 1 has even a single malfunction, then the choices for Artemis 2 become either to risk human lives by putting them in a rocket that you know doesn't work properly, or delay the Artemis program indefinitely until we can fly a perfect test of the SLS, and then restart the timeline after that, which would add an additional two years in the best case scenario, and would derail the entire Moon and Mars exploration program completely in the worst case. So, when we watch Artemis 1 lift off, we are watching the future of human space exploration either rise or fall along with it. Now, to rein that pessimism in a little bit, like we said earlier, we do have flight-tested hardware powering the SLS. We know that this engine system works, or did work in the past. So in theory, it should work again with just a few upgrades. And yes, even a well-tested system can fail. We all saw the Challenger disaster. It was horrifying, but it was also a humbling experience for NASA that is not forgotten. We can harp on them for being so late and over budget with their rocket, but the fact is that they are taking their time and getting it right. We've become so accustomed to the SpaceX approach of just trying and failing and blowing things up until they get it right. This is the first time in a generation that we've seen NASA go through the process and they go about it with a completely different approach. So we'll just have to see what happens. NASA is unwavering in their support of the SLS for all currently funded and all future Artemis missions. And for at least as long as Bill Nelson, one of the founding fathers of SLS, is in charge at NASA, that's going to be the plan. I don't know about you all, but personally, I can get past some of the glaring issues that are happening here and just be very excited to watch a giant rocket blast off to the moon. That is just so unbelievably cool and worth putting pessimism aside for now. What do you think though? How do you feel about SLS being the go-to rocket of the Artemis program? Let us know your thoughts down below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.